Right. So it, it's um, my great pleasure to introduce our next invited speaker, Dr. Kwang Mui, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Computer Science at the University of British Columbia. Uh, he's a member of the Computer Vision Lab there and also CADA, UBC's Center for Artificial Intelligence Decision Making and Action. The ultimate goal of Kwang Mui's research is to improve the quality of human life through smarter computer vision systems. He has been publishing some very impactful work that connects visual geometry with machine learning and allowing for a better understanding of the real world with numerous applications for autonomous vehicles, drones, robots, and augmented and mixed reality systems. Uh, he's also part of the organizing committee for CVPR 2023, which I believe will be held in Vancouver in 2023, hopefully, <laughs> physically. Uh, so thank you very much, Kwang Mu, for being here with us at GI 2021. And please take the virtual floor. Um, thank you. Thank you so much, Manolis, for the nice introduction. Let me try to quickly see if the spotlight feature would work. I've heard that there's a delay, so I'm going to assume that it works for 20 seconds or so, and then uh, try to change back to the uh, presenter view if uh, necessary. So um, today I'm going to talk a bit about our most recent work, uh, which we named Correspondent Transformers. So it's a bit of a work about how we match things in images, and uh, we will I uh, will actually go into a little bit in depth about how uh, we try to solve this thing, which actually relates a lot into graphics application later on, as you will see. So, oops. Sorry. Yeah, you can see that I have a lecture set up and be using it, and that's why uh, the sort of the annoyance. Uh, so uh, what we're interested in our group is mostly something about geometry. So what we want to answer is basically this question, uh, given images and other sensory inputs that whatever we can get our hands on. So here uh, you can imagine like you go to a place with these uh, sort of a building and then let's say you took photos of that building. And now given these photos, can we actually understand how the world looks like in terms of geometry and how uh, we took those photos in the first place. So in order to do that, uh, we have to relate between images. And But the benefit here is that once we are able to do that, we could create autonomous, autonomous agents and all these things that could interact with the environment. And of course, there are many, many methods and many, many questions revolving around this. But today, the question that I'm going to talk about is, uh, based on this very traditional way of getting 3D geometry, which is finding points that correspond between these two images that you see here, and try to see if we can triangulate, and through these triangulations, get the idea of how the 3D, those points in 3D are located, as well as how they were projected into your 2D images that you have. And of course, what the core question uh, that you need to answer in order to do that would be basically just how can we find points which are the same across different images. So that's why we are interested in this question in this work, which is where does the point go from one image to the other? So, um, the, and of course, uh, in this work, what we're going to do is as many uh, works do nowadays, we're going to use some machine learning things like the transformers here. But the very particular thing about this work that makes it unique is that we're going to basically try to transform this basic question that we're trying to ask into a mathematical formulation and into a machine learning framework that directly models this question. So like this. So imagine that COTR, the whole capital thing is a function that is parameterized by a set of parameters, what you would call like network weights, right? And then what we're trying to do here is basically learn a function that does the following, which is taking two images over there as somewhat the conditioning variable, and then uh, given a certain quarry point or quarry coordinate in one image, it just spits out the corresponding point in the other image. So it's really, uh, framework that answers the question. So just turning that question into a machine learning framework is all we are doing here. But the sort of the 
very important thing that this sort of a view brings, this functional point of view brings, is that we're able to actually unify what we call sparse correspondences and dense correspondence problems. For example, for the sparse correspondences, all you need to do is, let's say we have that function, then all you need to do is plug those images in and ask query points that correspond to the points that you're interested in. For example, the red point over there that, that's in, uh, that is related to the camera motion, or blue points over there that are related to some object motion, or maybe even green points that correspond to the pose change of a, something in the scene. And well, of course, the outputs are going to be the correspondences and that's directly your answer. Well, that's normal. Uh, but the another interesting thing is if you were to then uh, plug in a mesh grid of coordinates as input to this uh, COTR function that we're going to learn, then the outcome could actually be a dense correspondence map, like an optical flow map. It will be able to map for every pixel, uh, where does the pixel go into the other image? And of course, if you have that, you'll be able to warp one image to the other image. For example, here you're warping the image on the right to the view on the left, right? So it, it, it's a sort of a unified view of how we can view correspondence problems. And you can imagine that it's gonna be quite useful for many applications, which I will show later. Now, the question becomes then, hey, we have this new view of how we view the correspondence problem, but uh, can anything solve it? And why hasn't people done why haven't people done this before well the answer to that is quite simple we actually need a very specific architecture for this to actually happen so in fact we need to consider what the complicated function cotr function needs to do uh, is that it needs to be able to relate between pixels on different images right because if you are trying to find correspondences you better be able to relate for example uh, points on the window on the image on the top left should correspond to some other point in, on the windows of the image on the uh, bottom left. So to do that, uh, there is a, a sort of a trendy architecture that work, works really well for such relationship building called transformers. And we are, uh, and the whole uh, reason that this view works is because of that. So uh, in more detail, what we do is, as usual in how people use transformers in computer vision, we first build these uh, low resolution feature maps from um, like off the shelf uh, backbone networks like ImageNet, uh, Train, VGD, or ResNets. And then what we do is we concatenate the two images side by side. This is somewhat uh, very weird at first, but it's something natural and you need to do it this way because the way that the uh, attention is built in transformers is uh, as if you were relating words and sentences uh, you need to actually have them side by side so that the architecture itself supports actual relationship building between the uh, points in the images so here uh, basically we're relying on the self-attention mechanism in transformers to uh, force our architecture to figure out which points in one image are related to which points in the other. And then once those relationships are built, we use them as context, and then we input the query point uh, encoded into some positional embedding as usual in these days. And as that gets fed into the transformer, it will then uh, be related again with the relational context that we have, uh, finally giving us uh, the coordinate output as shown here. And one great benefit, if we do it this way, is that we are able to have a functional form of the correspondence problem, meaning that we can actually apply this to any modified version of the image that we're interested in. For example, uh, more specifically, you could actually run this correspondence finding algorithm on a set of images, and using the results that you have, you could actually zoom into the regions uh, that are potentially corresponding and then get even more accurate results. So here you see, for example, the points on the left two are being zoomed in to the points on the right two. And of course, uh, we had a look at whether that sort of a zooming in heuristic actually helps. And 
Uh, this is a, a histogram built with one of the errors. Uh, when we look at the errors uh, at each different zoom level and we accumulate the statistics, it looks like this. And you can clearly see the trend of the correspondence estimation errors becoming more and more skewed towards having lower and lower pixel error to the left. And this is somewhat obvious, but it, it was really nice to check. And the important thing in this sort of a strategy is that uh, if you look on at the architecture we had before, we are actually using a lower resolution feature map to use transformers because uh, unless you do that, you're going to have memory issues because of the just the pure memory requirement of transformers. Now, uh, this creates a sort of a bottleneck in the spatial resolution that the transformer sees. But if we are to zoom into these regions, that problem effectively gets alleviated because, uh, well, we are compensating for the fact that we're going to generate low resolution feature maps here. OK, so, um, so and of course, in addition, uh, this zooming in strategy gives us another benefit, uh, which is that we are able to look at the trend of how these estimates are coming out of our transformer. And if we look at those estimates and they're sort of drifting around everywhere, that actually is a great cue for us to know whether the estimates of our network is trustworthy or not. So we actually look at that and filter out points that make no sense. For example, if the standard deviation of the points uh, and the errors that you're getting is just too large, then you can just safely disregard that uh, point and just use the neighboring point correspondences to actually interpolate back this uh, actual correspondence result. And of course, another uh, thing that you could do is you could try changing the images left and right. Again, this is functional, so it doesn't stop you from actually changing the order of the images. And you can just query one point to the other image and then try to query it back. And if it doesn't form a cycle, that's also another cue for figuring out whether the network is knowing what it's doing or not. So these are some ways that we could actually filter out uncertainties as well. So that's how the whole pipeline actually does inference and estimates correspondences. Uh, let me just talk a little bit about how we train it. Uh, but I promise you this slide will be the sort of the only slide that has math. So don't fall asleep just yet. Uh, so uh, what we're doing is not fancy or too difficult here at all. So here um, you see on the top, what we're doing is basically saying that uh, the coordinates that you map with correspondence transformers, you should just simply um, be the same as the ground truth correspondence denoted as the X prime over there um, when, you, uh, when you estimate it with the network. And of course, we're gonna try to minimize this loss uh, and change the, uh, by changing the parameters of the network. And another additional loss term that we add is actually coming from the heuristic that we did before, which is saying that if you map one image uh, one point to the other image and try to map it back, you should form a cycle. So this is somewhat a regularization term we have to facil facilitate training a little bit more. And to train that, uh, as you might have noticed that you need a pixel level correspondence, right? So uh, our losses are basically saying move one pixel to the other and make sure that that movement, that correspondence is accurate. And therefore we need a data set with large amount of pixel wise labeling and various changes. And what we use is something called the mega depth data set. And it's uh, a structure from motion based uh, data set created with phototourism data. So you see there's a huge, whole bunch of uh, landmarks and you see that there are some depth maps over here that allows you to map pixel level uh, at a pixel level one from one image to the other. And the catch here is that not all of the scene will have depth information because not all of the scene can actually uh, be used to build 3D. For example, let's say some person just walked in front of the camera in one image and it's not there in the other image, there's no chance of us actually recovering the depth. But still, this is actually quite good enough so that we can use the points we have the depth for to train our method. And this is the only data set that we use, and this is the only training that we ever do. And what we do is once this is once our method is trained in this data set, we use it for all the other tasks. 
So uh, off to some results that we have here. Uh, this is, of course, we trained on phototourism. The first thing we do is test on phototourism. And this is not on the Megadeth data set. This is actually a different scene, although it's an outdoor scene made from phototourism similar to Megadeth. And these lines over here are the correspondences estimated by COTR between the two images. And the green ones are the ones that we have correct correspondences. The red ones are the ones that we have wrong correspondences. And even the red ones are not too bad. But you can see that the, there are many, many, many green correspondences, meaning that we are going to be able to estimate the camera pose difference between these two images, although they are taken from different times of days, different seasons, or even with different cameras. And the accuracy of the camera pose estimation is uh, about at the same level as state-of-the-art methods using key points. And now, well, that's not too surprising because you trained to build correspondences and you trained it for phototourism. Now, now here's the interesting part. So what we did again is taking that network that we have and we try to estimate dense optical flow for the kitty data set which is a data set where you have images and then it's a driving scenario and you're supposed to estimate the flow and this is the flow that we got at the middle uh, you can see that it's not that bad or actually it's quite good if you look at the error map you have on the top uh, besides the very fine edges on the car the error is not too big I, I like, especially like about uh, where we have here, where you have two cars going in opposite directions and we get the flow uh, quite properly here. And what is important to note here is that we never trained for these scenarios. Our scenes are more like phototourism, meaning that most of our pixels that we use for training are coming from buildings, not cars. And still it seems to work quite well. So when we look at this in terms of quantitative results, because qualitatives are always something that you can cherry pick, we did an analysis on the entire validation set of Kitty. And this is sort of the result that we get um, compared to various other methods. We do get state-of-the-art performance when it comes to evaluating the trustworthy points. And another thing that we did was we included points that were untrustworthy and we just interpolated the whole seen with some random sampling and simple um, triangulation and interpolation. And it seems that doing that also gives us pretty much on par results with the state of the art or slightly better, but I would just call it on par. And um, this is another data set, not the um, optical flow data set, but this is something called ET3D, which is a bit more like handheld scenario of a video and the rate here is how many frames difference do you have between the two image pairs? And in this case, this is for sparse phase evaluation. And then here we get much, much better results than the current state of the art. And one thing I want to emphasize here is that for the raft or uh, for the optical flow methods like raft over there, those are for uh, cases where it's like uh, in the same uh time frame and same camera and so on and so forth it's not for like uh different times of day like day and night scenarios which our method actually was trained for and still works as good as them if not better and this is actually one of my favorite favorite slides or favorite figures from um, the correspondence transformer work that we did which actually shows that transformers matter so here, uh, the third column over here is when we replace the transformer architecture with a simple MLP, multi-layer perceptron. Uh, because the uh, framework of asking the network where the point goes could be implemented with any, any type of network architecture, right? And so MLP is the easiest thing, so we tried it, and it turns out with an MLP, you sort of get a global motion of the scene, but not exactly uh, correspondences. For example, you see the dome over here moves from right to left compared to the arc uh, because of the perspective change. And that motion or that correspondence cannot be modeled well with the MLP on the third column, whereas with the transformer, it is uh, done quite well. 
And this is still uh, for the tourism. So I have another example that is way, way on different from phototourism. Uh, this is what the first author student actually uh, quickly tried and it worked so well that we put it on the paper on the last day of the deadline. Um, and uh, yeah, we got some uh, lucky results here, which shows that if you try to warp the source image to the target using optical flow with our method, and even when you just have water bottles and you switch the order, you can actually still do that. And Again, I want to mention that this scene over here, no way in no way it looks like photo tourism, but it still works. So it really shows that using our architecture and our framework, the uh, correspondent transformer actually learned to correspond. So here are some demos. For example, uh, what we are gonna do is we're gonna just track that um, frame and then augment some other uh, photo of it. I have no idea uh, how this was chosen, but um, the student actually seemed to like this photo. So uh, we could do that. That's not too hard. We just need the four corners to be matched and followed. And of course, I mentioned that we want to do this to get 3D. So here's an example of us trying to get 3D with correspondence transformers. Uh, we use the two images and once they're calibrated, we can actually create a dense warp thing and create 3D models like that. And here's another example, uh, completely uh, different background. So the only thing common is the things in the middle. So that's what you get. And another interesting thing that we tried is, hey, since it seems to know correspondences, can we actually run it on something very, very different, like right? human faces? So what we did is we detected these things with an off-the-shelf uh, landmark detection algorithm. And then we tried to track it throughout the video and it seems to work quite well. So these points are actually just tracked, being tracked from the first frame, uh, which was quite impressive. And finally, since our title is Transformers, we, down, uh, we got this Transformers video clip from YouTube and tried to track that part over there I put, I marked as red. And um, to our surprise, this also worked. So uh, really, uh, you can use correspondence transformers to build uh, correspondences on transformers as well. So uh, in a nutshell, uh, what I've shown is a framework that can solve both single sparse and dense correspondence problems. Importantly, train once, apply everywhere. Um, if you're thinking of Java, uh, yes, I sort of uh, got that <laughs> phrase from Java. And, but it really works for our case. So, and, and here, uh, again, the transformer architecture seems to be really critical, at least according to our observations. So we are interested in solving uh, this um, matching problem, but that's not the only problem that we're interested in our group. We are interested in basically all the problems arising in this setup over here. And what we like to do, uh, so, and a short ad for our other questions, there are works that we show at CPR, for example, where do we look at, or how can you render from 3D to 2D in an effective way using your rendering, using decomposed radiance fields. Uh, so I would also invite you to check these out at our um, CEPR, which is happening in just a month. But um, I think um, that's all for my talk today. And of course, I would like to thank all the collaborators I'm presenting, but I would say it's uh, the blood and tears of Wei and the uh, far left and with help from my uh, fellows, uh, collaborators at Google as well. So all the code and things are already available online, so do check it out as well. Thank you, and I'll be happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you so much, Fangmu. Uh, really cool work. Uh, we have a couple of minutes for a few questions. A reminder for everyone on the live stream to ask questions using the chat. Uh, and while we're waiting, I'll, I'll get things going. Uh, it's interesting to see how the large-scale pixel-wise ground truth that you had in the Megadeth data set enabled this uh, work. And yeah. so I was wondering, were you in any way limited by the properties of that data set? Is there some dream that you have of what a, a next-generation data set for uh, you know, work that, like what you did or future work would look like? Yeah, so, um, yeah, it is uh, sort of... Uh 
I think, a limiting factor. We did find that some of these correspondences that we get in our data set are not exactly pixel accurate. We had some look and then uh, there were some um, uh, misalignments, especially it was really tricky for us to uh, at first uh, get this pipeline, reprojection pipeline to work properly, but we finally managed it. So one of the things that we're always interested in is perhaps we could bootstrap this because these data sets are created with um, more traditional means and we have better methods that now give us more accurate alignments and more accurate matches. I, I'm really curious whether this can actually go back to the methods uh, data set and then enhance that and then keep on enhancing. But um, that does require a lot of resources. So I haven't got my hands to try it yet. Got it. What do you think about the synthetically generated data? Do you think that you could achieve similar results if you relied purely on simulated depth and pixel-wise ground truth? Yes. So that's actually a great question. And uh, maybe it's a, a great opportunity for me to also put an ad that uh, one of the things that we're doing in our group is something called the image matching challenge. And a part of that, uh, one of our organizers have created a synthetic data set that is realistic. And we haven't had a chance to try it on that yet, but I, from what I can see, the rendering qualities are so good that I can't really uh, distinguish them too well from like real images. So uh, that would definitely be another direction as well. Yeah, yeah. Sounds like uh, there's some interesting stuff to, that could be done there as well. Uh, yeah, so uh, yeah, uh, like trying to figure out whether the limits of the method currently that we have is because of the method or the data set is really an interesting thing that we would like to answer. Right. So I think we don't yet have any other questions on the chat. Um, and we are almost at time. So we can probably wrap up uh, and uh, thank you uh, once again. Uh, thank you from me and thank you from, I'm sure that all our virtual audience as well, virtual applause <laughs> coming from everybody. Uh, thank you, Kwangu, uh, for taking the time for joining us here at thank the you for having me. Vir Virtual Graphics Interface 2021. Uh, really cool work. Thank you so much. Thank you.